In L.A. this week, getting a ride from Hollywood to LAX just got easier as the flyaway bus begins a new route. Details next. The city of Los Angeles remembers the fallen heroes of 9-11. I'm Yana Kay and I'll take you to the ceremony next. I feel the ancestors with me as I walk. A walk from Mission San Gabriel to the site where our city was founded 233 years ago. We take you there. Hello and welcome to LA This Week. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ellen Chang. If LA's starting to get a reputation as a public transit city, that's long been the plan of city and transportation leaders. And the latest addition to the transit family, a convenient and low-cost bus service between Hollywood and LAX. Here's Yana Kay. City and airport officials climb aboard this bus to officially introduce a new flyaway bus service from Hollywood to Los Angeles International Airport. Today we are taking a common sense step forward to make sure that Hollywood is linked to the world and the world can come to Hollywood. City and LAX officials gathered in Hollywood at Argyle to welcome the new service, which will take passengers directly to each terminal at LAX. This brings the number of total LAX connections to 36. LAX officials say the new service reinforces their commitment to reducing traffic and improving air quality while offering an invaluable service. We think this service is going to be very attractive to international passengers who may not know their way around our sometimes complicated transportation system. Where's the number one place they want to go? Hollywood. Right here. So this is making it easy. And for you guys that live in Hollywood, get out of your cars, come to LAX on the flyaway. Officials expect 125,000 passengers to use the bus service over the next year, which means fewer cars headed to LAX on the roads. I think as city leaders, we want to make all of our neighborhoods more accessible. It's, it's good for the economy to have more visitors, um, and it's a quality of life uh, issue as well. The flyaway bus service route in Hollywood joins four other routes already in operation at Santa Monica, Union Station, Van Nuys, and Westwood. The new non-stop bus service will operate between 5.15 a.m. and 10.15 p.m. every day, including weekends and holidays. Bus fare one way is $8. I'm Yana Kay for L.A. This Week. The remains of a badly decomposed woman have LAPD officers searching for clues, and now they hope a canvassing of the neighborhood and a cash reward give them answers. Anna Marcos has more. It's a case that has stumped LAPD detectives for four years. Workers at this L.A. recycling plant found something else besides recyclables as they sorted through discarded items, a woman's badly decomposed body. But four years later, police say they still don't know how long she'd been dead or what caused her death. She was found nude, wrapped in trash bags and uh, bed linen sheets. Now, clutching at straws, police are offering a $50,000 reward for information that helps identify the victim and leads to finding those who caused her death. Police have also enlisted the help of 80 LAPD Explorer cadets to canvass the area around Echo Park and Silver Lake. The cadets are handing out flyers that show what the woman might have looked like alive. Police believe she was Hispanic or Caucasian, anywhere between 35 to 80 years old and about 5 foot 4, with brown or auburn hair. This is interesting. I've never seen, uh, I've never seen any uh, information uh, delivered this way. Someone's daughter, someone knows who this woman is, and no one's come forward, no one's said, hey, she's missing. Police believe the victim was dumped in one of the blue recycling bins, but it could have been anywhere in an area that covers Hollywood, East L.A., Echo Park, and Silver Lake. And unless someone steps forward, the chances of solving the mystery will become slimmer and slimmer. I'm Anna Margos for L.A. This Week. Anyone with information can call the LAPD Central Area Homicide Detective Bureau at 213-996-1889 or 213-996-1890. Los Angeles joined cities across the nation as Americans came together to remember the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Yana Kay takes us to one L.A. Fire Department ceremony.
Retired New York firefighter Paul Geidel holds a picture of his son Gary, also a New York firefighter who was killed in 2001 when he responded to the World Trade Center attacks. Paul and his other son spent nearly nine months digging through the rubble trying to find him. We were able to bring uh, eight members of Rescue Company 1 home and many other people, of course, but we never found Gary. The sound of bagpipes kicked off the 9-11 Day of Remembrance, where Gary Geidel and thousands like him were remembered. But every act of hatred, we win when we come together in love, and we come together in love for you and for all of those who remember the victims of 9-11 today. The ceremony held at the L.A. Fire Department's Memorial Training Center included the playing of taps. It was just one of a dozen other tributes that took place in the Southland, paying respects to those who perished 13 years ago in the attacks on our nation. This is the meaning of sacrifice. This is the meaning of selflessness. This is truly the meaning of service. These are people that put the safety of strangers above their own. L.A. firefighters even traveled to New York to help in the rescue operations. Some of them were on hand on this day. The amount of debris was 14 stories tall of debris. Uh, it was still burning underneath. Uh, the sights, the sounds, the smell, uh, people tr digging in on this rubble pile trying to get through because they knew people were trapped in there. The proud stars and stripes hung midair beneath two fire ladders while three helicopters flew overhead in missing man formation. The ceremony took place right here in front of this monument. The piece of metal was part of the World Trade Center. Now it serves as a memorial to the 343 New York firefighters who were lost, but will never be forgotten. I'm Yana Kay for LA This Week. This year marks the first time that the 9-11 Memorial Plaza in New York was open to the public on the anniversary date. Some neighborhood programs tackle safety, others combat pollution. Gil Reyes tells us about a program that handles both and more, a lot more. Good morning. L.A. City Attorney Mike Fuhr announcing big changes this fall at Vista Middle School in Panorama City. So far, some 30 parents have volunteered for daily neighborhood patrols. Their goal, to create safe passageways for their children to and from campus. And that's just the beginning. We're not only bringing all these resources to bear, but we're also committing to test whether they work by analyzing statistics as the program goes forward. Fewer's neighborhood school safety program targets four L.A. schools in low-income communities. Panorama City Council member Nuri Martinez is concerned about prostitution and drug dealing in her district and hopes parent patrols will further open communication lines with the LAPD. Oftentimes you will find people who are very afraid, who don't want to speak up. And I think through this program, empowering the parents on how to communicate better with law enforcement and the city attorney's office really will enable them to speak up and take their neighborhoods back. The program also promises to crack down on polluters operating near campus. The L.A. City Attorney's Office says it's identified over 100 possible polluters near the Vista campus alone, two of them now facing criminal charges. The City Attorney's Office isn't stopping there. It also plans to crack down on area businesses caught selling tobacco to minors, boost checkups of parolees living near schools, and ramp up efforts to reduce truancy. In Panorama City, Gil Reyes for L.A. This Week. Again, three other campuses are also taking part in the program. The Han family has made public service its legacy to Los Angeles, and now one more Han, former Mayor James Han, gets his name etched on a public building. Anna Marcos takes us to the unveiling. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now my great honor to introduce my big brother, Jim Han. U.S. Congresswoman Janice Hahn's last move as city council member was to get City Hall East renamed in honor of her brother, James Hahn, in 2011. He had served L.A. as city controller, city attorney, and mayor. He is now a U.S. District Court judge, a lifetime of public service. L.A.'s biggest movers and shakers watched as the new building name was finally unveiled. Quite literally, ladies and gentlemen, we would not be a city today were it not for Jim Hahn. We might have two or three cities. 
Han helped keep the city together in spite of secession bids by Hollywood, San Pedro and the Valley in 2002, at the risk of alienating some voters. He helped create new clean air and energy policies and revamped the LAPD as it crawled back from corruption scandals and a federal consent decree. He replaced then Police Chief Bernard Parks with New York Police Commissioner William Bratton. Under the outstanding leadership of Bill Bratton and Jim Hahn, crime plummeted to levels unseen since 1950. Morale skyrocketed throughout LAPD and people throughout our city once again felt safe and secure. The Han family name is no stranger to city landmarks. Several parks and buildings were named in honor of Han's father, Kenneth Han, including the Kenneth Han Hall of Administration. Kenny Han served 10 terms as county supervisor. Two great men dedicated their entire lives in service to the people of Los Angeles. The decisions were not really tough decisions. Decisions were easy to make. All I had to decide was, what's the best thing to do for the city? What's the right thing? Some say it was those very best things he did for the city that cost James Hahn his second term as mayor. I'm Anna Marcos for LA This Week. The renaming of City Hall East was paid for with private funds. Angelinos have been getting their feet wet with the kayaking program offered at the LA River. Rasha Goel has more on how paddling the scenic stretch has taken a new turn. Ready, set, paddle. Kayakers of all levels recently had the chance to compete in the first ever boat race on the LA River, organized by the LA River Expedition. While Angelinos have had the chance to leisurely enjoy the river for the past three years, this was the first time a competition was allowed to be held on the waterway. I've kayaked uh, across the world, but for just for fun. So I'm really excited that this is now uh, an opportunity that people in Los Angeles can experience. Entry to the competition was on a donation basis. We suggest from all the way up to $65 to help support LA River Expeditions, which is a nonprofit. And our work has been to open up the river to the community. The competition took place on a three quarter mile stretch of rapids and flat water from Fletcher Drive down to Marsh Park in Elysian Valley. Races were held in various age and skill level categories. Officials say it's all part of revitalizing the river and bringing it back to the community. Actor and environmental activist Ed Begley Jr., a Los Angeles native, says the LA River needs to be preserved. It's the LA River that brought people here, this beautiful ecosystem, and so we need to protect it and realize its value. Councilmember Tom LaBonge came to cheer on the kayakers and share a bit of river history. 233 years ago, 44 people walked nine miles from the Mission San Gabriel, the banks of the river. The life of the city started on that river. Now life on the city is coming back to the river. Hopefully you know people going by on their bikes they'll be inspired to you know get out or people watching will get out off the couch and come outside and at the end of the day it wasn't about winning the race for these river supporters it was about making the LA River once again an integral part of our living breathing city I'm Rasha Goel for LA This Week the L.A. River Revitalization Plan includes transforming the neglected waterway into a 51-mile greenway with a bike path, parks, public art, and waterfront businesses. And you just heard Councilman Tom LaBonge talk a bit about the founding of our city. And that's because Los Angeles just celebrated another birthday. And at the recent celebration, the story of why diversity is woven into the fabric of our city becomes quite clear. Another year, 233 to be exact, another birthday. Another walk from Mission San Gabriel to the El Pueblo Historical Monument in downtown LA. The annual walk follows the historic route that Los Pobladores used when they founded Los Angeles. For a select few, the walk is a real retracing of the nine mile walk their ancestors made. We are a group of descendants from the, uh, of the original founders who arrived uh, here to this area of El Pueblo, as it's known, in 1781. I get real personal when it comes to back then. I feel the ancestors with me as I walk. The Pobladores, or townspeople, were 44 original settlers and four soldiers who founded the city. Mayor Eric Garcetti paid homage to their heritage. <laughs> 
the 44 who continued on of the pobladores who came here came from Africa, from Americas, from Europe. In other words, the diversity we have in this city today isn't something that arrived last year. It was here from the beginning. I feel very proud and very humble at the same time about the family history. But being able to proudly proclaim their family's connection to the founding of the city was not always easy. In fact, the group Los Pobladores 200, made up of direct descendants of the Pobladores, was formed only at the city's 200th birthday, a little more than three decades ago. There was a lot of racism after the 1850s towards uh, the mestizo population. And uh, so a lot of us were not told of the stories and we discovered them uh, through either stories that we did find in family or doing our geneolo genealogy research. But today that history is being embraced not only by the descendants of our city's founders, but by those who take pride in being called an Angelino. Not everyone walked the nine miles from the San Gabriel Mission. Many, including the mayor, gathered at Union Station to take the symbolic walk across the street to El Pueblo. Recent home fires have city leaders giving out free smoke detectors. Another building on Broadway downtown gets ready for its second act. And a cobra on the loose finds a new home down south. Approximately two-thirds of home fire deaths occur in homes without working smoke alarms. Statistics show working smoke alarms increase the chance of surviving a home fire by 50 percent. In an effort to encourage their use, Mayor Eric Garcetti and Fire Chief Ralph Terrazas announced LA residents can get a free smoke alarm at any of the 106 neighborhood fire stations across the city. The mayor says this is all part of his back-to-basics agenda for Los Angeles, which includes emergency preparedness. We reported a while back regarding the medical marijuana farmer's market that opened in the city and the city attorney's fight to shut it down. Well, a superior court judge has ruled in the city's favor, issuing a preliminary injunction against Progressive Horizon, Inc., the operator of the farmer's market citing its failure to comply with Proposition D, which limits the proliferation of medical pot shops within city limits. The ruling stated that Progressive Horizon, Inc. circumvented the law to produce a farmer's market over two consecutive weekends in early June of this year. Councilman Jose Huizar's office announced that a buyer has been selected to purchase the former May Company department store. The building encompasses most of the west side of the block from Broadway to Hill Street between 8th and 9th Streets. The historic 1.1 million square foot Broadway Trade Center built in 1908 will become a centerpiece of Councilmember Weezar's Bringing Back Broadway initiative aimed at increasing economic development and job creation in the area as well as preserving the history of the district. The monocled cobra caught by L.A. County Animal Control and later put in quarantine at the Los Angeles Zoo has found a new home at the San Diego Zoo. These photos were taken at L.A. Zoo's quarantine facility by Ian Recchio, curator of reptiles and amphibians. The hooded cobra had been on the loose for four days earlier this month before it was captured in Thousand Oaks. Residents believe a neighbor may have owned the pet. And that brings us to this week in tweets. The white cobra on the loose sure got tongues hissing and fingers typing. It even had its own Twitter accounts. Yes, accounts, plural. The albino cobra tweeted after it was caught, someone call HBO because my story is not finished. Season two of True Detective, Albino Cobra Nights starts right now. On another one of its Twitter accounts, the albino monocled cobra tweeted, Brainstorming today on possible merchandising. What would you all think about a free Whitey mouse pad? The LA Zoo also got in on the act, tweeting two of the Cobra's Twitter accounts. Bad news, your housing application got denied. One bad reference. But jokes aside, the zoo also shared this Vine video of the reptile curator handling the Thousand Oaks Cobra while at the LA Zoo quarantine facility. It also took to Twitter to clear up a misnomer that the Cobra is in fact not an albino but a leucistic Cobra, which means lack of all pigment and not just the lack of melanin. You can tell by the snake's blue eyes versus red with albino animals. And again, the Cobra is now at the San Diego Zoo. Well, for the past 15 years, Point Furman Park has been home to one of South Bay's longest running classic car shows. Rasha Goel has more on how this show is just more than a place to talk cars. 
classic cars, barbecues, and a scenic view. It's all part of Car Show by the Sea, where car aficionados from across Southern California and even out of state bring out their beauties for a day to show off. It's all for a good cause. The Classic Car Show is a fundraiser organized each year by the Legends Car Club and the nonprofit Lions Club of San Pedro. This is one of our biggest fundraisers, annual fundraiser. And then we take the proceeds from there and give it back to the community. The event started as a derby-style car race with the classic car show element added soon after. We stopped doing the downhill race because of the manpower and the, the cost of closing the streets and, and different things that uh, we didn't feel it was worth doing any longer, although we have an awful lot of young people that wished we still were doing it. Nonetheless, the car show by the sea still draws hundreds of participants and spectators. This year, there were about 600 cars. This is my third year here and it's always great, always great. And you didn't have to be a car lover to appreciate these classic beauties. As they say, oldies but goodies. I'm Rasha Goel for LA This Week. The car show had the support of the Department of Recreation and Parks and Councilman Joe Buscaino's office. Playing soccer in West L.A. just got a bit more fun for kids as officials debuted a new soccer field with the drought in mind. Yana Kay has more. Eight-year-old Grant Howe and his brothers are having a blast kicking around the soccer ball on this brand new synthetic soccer field at the Westwood Recreation Center. I really like soccer and finally there's something that I can really play soccer on. Various city officials and community members gathered to officially reopen the field to the neighborhood with a ribbon cutting. The soccer field's real grass was removed and replaced by turf. The field is 45 by 90 yards with perimeter fencing and secure gates. Officials say a field this size would require 50,000 gallons of water per week. We in the department are absolutely very conscientious and sensitive to the drought and to also all of our parks. We would love to have one of these in every single park, but it takes partners, <laughs> takes a few more dollars, and it takes a lot of commitment from the community. And there was certainly plenty of commitment from the community, working for nearly three years with city officials to bring this field to life. It's huge. Uh, for the park, it's huge. It's going to be the premier field in the area. For the kids, they have a great surface that is even, that is flat, uh, and they're going to love it. And so far, it appears they are loving it. And at only five years old, Grant's brother Luke already knows how important it is to save water and plus, there's an additional benefit. It won't get muddy because it's pretend grass. This is absolutely a great step in the right direction. This brings the total number of synthetic fields in Los Angeles to 24 and three more are currently under construction. And that means a big goal for the city. I'm Yana Kay for LA This Week. And in this week's list of things to do, rally cross at the waterfront, a sketching course, and archaeology for kids. The giant rubber duck may have bid farewell to the Port of Los Angeles, but as promised, the LA waterfront is keeping its calendar full of activities to keep visitors entertained. On Saturday, September 20th and Sunday the 21st, Red Bull Global Rally Cross returns to the scenic San Pedro waterfront for its seventh event of the 2014 season. It had made its debut at the port back in April for its inaugural media day. With the roots of Rally Cross in America firmly entrenched in Southern California, a victory in LA would be a hometown triumph for many of the series' stars. The LA waterfront is located at 3011 Minor Street in San Pedro. For tickets and other information, go to redbullglobalrallycross.com. Friday's racing is free and open to the public. Join landscape architect and architectural illustrator Richard E. Scott as he opens his sketchbook and shares with students his innovative approach to learning freehand observational sketching. The Sketching on Location course takes place at UCLA Extension at 306 1010 Westwood Center in Westwood on Saturday, September 20th from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. with other dates available. In this course, students learn how to draw anything with excellent accuracy, how to see with the eyes of an artist and what separates artistic expression from merely copying. Students will sketch architecture and landscape while in the classroom as well as outdoors. 
For the cost of this course and to sign up, go to uclaextension.edu. Is your child a future archaeologist? You can get him or her ready for that day by going to the Skirball's simulated outdoor archaeological dig and field laboratory called Dig It, going on every weekend except for October 4th. Sift through sand to find hidden ancient artifacts, examine your findings, and work with the archaeology staff to piece together the puzzles found in a near eastern Iron Age town. This is included with museum admission. Drop in any time before 4.30 p.m. during weekend museum hours. The Skirball Cultural Center is located at 2701 North Sepulveda Boulevard. Go to skirball.org. And that's a look at some upcoming things to do. A giant party in honor of a historic Wilmington landmark, and everyone was invited. Anna Marcos takes us to the Banning Museum to show us what a 150th birthday bash looks like. You might think you're at an old-time square dance hoot nanny at some New England mansion, and you'd be somewhat correct. Cowgirls and cowboys of all stripes got in a little line dancing action to help celebrate the 150th anniversary of the very New England style Banning Museum in Wilmington, formerly the Banning family home. I got to tell you that Phineas Banning, actually, who is known as the father of the Port of Los Angeles, built this mansion that's here behind me. The Bannings came from Wilmington, Delaware. When they landed here, it reminded them a lot of their old town back east. So here we have Wilmington, California. The mansion, built in 1864, was shut down during World War II to provide military housing. But the community finally succeeded in reopening it to the public as part of Banning Park. The Friends of the Banning Museum now raise money for its upkeep and programs like its Victorian Christmas and summer concert series and the daily museum tours. You will see some of the original furniture you will see that was used by Phineas Banning himself, including an, an 1875 uh, piano. You'll also see period time clothing of what the kids wore, their games, and of course you will see their kitchen. And let's not forget those historic hoot nannies. Even the barbecue chicken, ribs, and tri-tip made in the open air are history lessons here along with that big pot of campfire beans. I'm Anna Marcos for LA This Week. That's going to do it for this edition. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ellen Chang. A reminder that you could catch us online at lacityview.org. You can also follow and like us on Facebook. We leave you with more of the Los Pobladores walk to mark the city's birthday. We'll see you back here next week for more of LA This Week.